Hi, Steve. Hi, Jim. So as I see it, I've got uh, one big problem with gateway albums. Okay. And that is that usually once that gate is open, we don't bother to close it. <laughs> so true. <laughs> And welcome to Two Guys Talking About Records, that phenomenal broadcast where there are just two guys and all they do is talk about records. That's about it. I, that's about it. That's that's what we do. And <laughs> I'm Steve, and I am a record collector. And I am Jim, and I own a record store, but I've been known to dabble in record collecting. So it's a, it's a balancing relationship I have within my psyche. <laughs> sure is. It doesn't always work. So today's topic at hand, uh, Steve and I are going to talk about gateway albums, but not so much in the way you think. Things that have opened the doors for us to open our mind, if you will, expanding our horizons Without to other genres. Genetics. Yes, <laughs> to other genres. We'll see how that goes. Because usually, I think you know, a lot of folks get narrowed in. They know they like what they like. They collect what they like but there are some collectors i think you and i are both in in that ilk that that uh, say okay let's experiment with this this is not necessarily something sometimes it works it is in your case and sometimes it doesn't work in lots of other cases exactly and, I, and, and there is and i i get accused on my channel often for eclectic tastes but <laughs> it's it's about trying new things, trying new types of music, because, I mean, there's so much that happens out there still yep. within the musical landscape and just being a part of, you know, trying to enjoy it. And it gets exciting. So yeah. we will get to that and more in a couple seconds. We've got a couple of news items that we want to talk about today, too, in the uh, vinyl world. But I need to start off uh, with a shout out and a thank you uh -huh. to um, my friend Heather. You remember Heather? You used to work yeah. at the store for a while. She is in New Jersey now, and she is married, and uh, she texted me a while ago. She says, did you buy this new uh, Rush at 50 book? And, you know, knowing that I'm a Rush fan, I said, no, I have not yet. I don't know if Kim put it on a Christmas list or not, and we'll see where it goes. She goes, well, don't, and I don't want to spoil the surprise, but don't get it. So <laughs> this is a brand new book uh, called Rush at 50 by the uh, music journalist Daniel uh, Buxban. I hope I'm getting his name right there, and it is basically just a... Uh, it's a it's a huge book chronicling 50 years of rush with lots of photographs yeah. broken up. I've barely scratched the surface because I just got this. But uh, Heather said, this is a special one. I thought, oh, OK, so what do we got? And uh, you can't quite see it there, but that's autographed by the author. Oh, uh, neat. She, through a mutual friend, knew the author of this book and uh, got that signed and sent out. Says, Jim, thanks for reading my book and uh, thank you for liking Rush. People who don't like them are stupid. <laughs> so thank you once again to Heather. Uh, just it, this means a lot to me. Uh, she is a good egg and I will have some fun reading through that book. I can't wait yeah. to dig into it. I think I had my couple of days off. I'll, I'll have that with me and I'll start uh, start thumbing through it. Yeah, she's great. That's that's fantastic. Real that nice. cool. Nice. Always thinking so. Um other news items we'll get to in just a couple of seconds, but as this is the Vinyl Community Podcast, how about we kick things off uh, on this week's episode with our recent pickups? I don't know if I slow down a little bit. I've got I've got three decent ones this week. Not a lot, but uh, how did you do this week? And I, I asked knowing that there was a package or two sent your way. <laughs> there was. I went to a record show. Yep, I went to the record show. Yeah. Um, so, and then, you know, I think maybe only one thing I ordered, but uh, yeah, so... Okay. How did that record show go? I saw your Sunday video, or one at night, maybe not your Sunday video, one of your other videos. Yeah, Thursday, Thursday. You were not, you were not held in check by your wingman. <laughs> he was doing pretty good till the very end, and and <laughs> and then the holy moly came out, and it was oh, like, no. I, 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 I just have to have it, and and, <laughs> and, and, and I'm having, and I'm having some problems with this, so we'll bring that up because. Okay. It's just, yeah, yeah. Uh, moral dilemmas, moral vinyl collecting dilemmas are happening right hey, now. When it happens, oh, I, yeah, that that Queen one was my dilemma. We'll give an update, not this week, but next. I'm working on something. I'll tell you about uh, that next week. 
perfect. What was your well? What what's your pickups then? All right, so my pickups. The first off, and uh, so uh, I, now I know I've shown this on YouTube, and no one else gets this. This is the only channel I think that YouTube is the only one that shows us on live, right? Or is Facebook? So, well, I don't know. It's the Jimi Hendrix one. Oh, the, yep. Yep, the X-rated version. Uh, I, won't, uh, I won't zoom in, so we're all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, this 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 one here, I, I, I used to have uh, this cover version of it. And, you know, actually, Electric Lady Land is just a fantastic album. Yeah. You know, I don't show much from the 60s, even the 70s necessarily. is isn't like I hate the music. There's just too much new stuff coming. But when I saw this, I got it at a good price. I was kind of excited to get this back into the collection again. So that now, was... Is that, uh, is that an early or first press UK? Or uh, is it, it is not a first press. press. It's a 73 UK press. Okay. I know that the uh, the well, I don't know if they would call it X rated, maybe a hard R rated. How's that? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Um, those were only UK issues, actually. They were. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. Only the UK. For those uh, of you listening, that means that that's the uh, Jimi Hendrix cover with all of the naked ladies all over on it. That's front true. Back. That's a good yes, a good point. Yes, yeah. for your visualization purposes. <laughs> uh, I did pick up Adam Ant, King of the Wild Frontier, at the record yeah. show. This was on. I did enter the record show with a list on my phone. I even had on most of it the prices on Discogs from medium to high. So as I looked at an album, oh, I would yeah. know. Except I did not have it on this one. And the one I bought, and I paid too much. <laughs> so my 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 intention was great. I had purpose to what I was doing. It's just as usual, I blew it. So uh, yeah, but uh, Adam and Rod Frontier, I love. I won't ask, but uh, generally speaking, from my experience, when that comes through, that's never really more than a eight to ten dollar record. Yeah, yeah, normally in the store. I've seen it higher out here, and so I thought, okay, that seems like a good price. But yeah, no, it was quite a bit above that. And when I popped into Discogs, I really started to look, and I, I've looked before, but I couldn't find anything in the U.S. You know, mm -hmm. but now I did, and it's like, oh, oh well, crap. But <laughs> luckily, it was that 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 was a, didn't break the bank on it. So there you go. I've been looking for it, couldn't find it. Uh, picked up a mole five L Stewart's time passages. I love this album. I only need year of the cat in this one. I used to have almost his whole discography, but there's only two albums I really listened to. I do have this and, you know, in an OG, ooh, like $3 or something. It goes yep. for, uh, so, and I got a really nice price on this. Yeah. Just a mole five. I have mole five of year of the cat too. I love his music. Sounds good. This is the dilemma, uh, and and this is this this was the big one. Uh, Diamanda Gallus and John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. uh, I bought uh, back in the '90s when this came out, mid '90s, 1994. Uh, College Music Journal. You know, I got the CD, and they had a sample from this, and I was blown away. And the song was "Do You Take This Man," which is just an incredible video. It's so intense. This gal scares the bejesus out of me. I mean, <laughs> she is one intense woman. Uh, but it's so I went out and I bought the CD. And even after the flood, I saved that CD. You know, I obviously don't have a case, but I liked it that much. Now, this is only pressed in the UK one time. Hmm. That's it. Because I've looked for it. And, and, and it's just the prices were too high. So here it is at the record show, and it was not cheap. I, uh, it, it wasn't like I'm going to go to the poor house, but it cost quite a bit. But I've never seen it before. And this is just one of those, if I don't buy it, I'll never see it again yep. in the moments. So I bought it. And I went with a guy, uh, Tice, uh, his channel Sound of Minder, and he goes, well, that looks sealed. I go, I never even checked. I just saw it and grabbed it. Sure as hell, it's a sealed record. It's sealed. Oh, so there's the dilemma. Yeah. So I, I have the CD, and I've been playing the CD. Love the CD. If I open this, it drops like $150 in value. <laughs> that's, that's not <laughs> insignificant. <laughs> no, 
it's not. Wow. It's not. So that's the dilemma. I keep looking at this, and I show it on my channel, and you know, I bring bring that up because then I get all of this. What's wrong with you? You know, it's just you get a lot of extra comments on that one. But you know, yeah. we, we talked about it sealed versus unsealed. What do you do? Music is made to be listened to. I totally get that. I generally always do that. But then I'm looking at this go, Jesus, holy crap, man. <laughs> and then you got you to gotta find it within yourself to say, yes, music is made to be listened to, but I can listen to this music already without opening this. But is there going to be a big difference, you think, in the... Audio I've quality. Just, I've justified it. There you go. <laughs> now, it could be getting ghosted in there. I don't know. The whole vinyl <laughs> could be being ghosted. I do. <laughs> That's a whole other thing. Well, uh, this this is a good opportunity for folks in the comment sections to let us know. You know what should Steve do? <laughs> oh, I pretty much. And, I mean, that's it's it's not normally you'd say. Well, if I open it, it's it's worth maybe ten twenty dollars less. No, and not in this case, huh? <laughs> no, oh, <laughs> it takes time. Now the other ones, you know, the medium price is very good. That would still be near mint, but it's yeah, just but... like a. <laughs> oh boy! Well, well, um, let us know. Yep. Well, I just brought this in. This is Bjork's Vespertine. Um, it's my favorite Bjork album by far. This is an OG. I had a repress, so there's my albums that I saved from the flood because, again, it's my favorite Bjork. Mm -hmm. I saw this at the record show. I, I It was one of those, ooh, I've been wanting that. And then uh, my, my wingman said, well, let's, let's just see how much they're asking on Discogs. I let go, well, God, that's quite a bit less. So, uh yeah, I went home, ordered off Discog, <laughs> <laughs> and got it for quite a bit less than the there record show. Go. <laughs> yeah, um, just a couple more here. Um, I just finished uh, reading a book on uh, the jazz of the 50s, mm -hmm. and it goes in. But it really concentrated on John Coltrane, Miles Davis, and Bill Evans, and really looked at them and their life. And it took them all, all and you went all the way through their life. It, you know. Bill Evans is okay. You know, he he was a great pianist, but a, a little mellow, and he never kind of really changed a lot as he went, in my in my opinion. But this was, you know, and I do have a few Bill Evans in the previous collection and a lot more uh, record store day. I mean, what's a record store day, Jim, without Bill Evans? I mean, That's right. I mean, you have to have a Bill Evans live album because he did a ton of them. But this is considered his uh, masterpiece. And I, what was it, 60? I don't know, 1959, possibly. Um, it came out, and it's the one to have. So, yeah, I went and got it. I mean, it's it's enjoyable. It, it is. It's a little more upbeat than some of his stuff, because otherwise it can get really sleepy. Uh, other couple of things. This is just from Radio Wasteland that came in. Um Jim got me into oh, yeah. uh, to get the Billy Strings. This is another <laughs> Jim-related thing, uh, but it's very good. Uh, it is kind of trippy, and yeah, he he, he definitely um, was was smoking some stuff. I think on some of these. Oh yeah, yeah, which he admits freely. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, there's a whole song about it. <laughs> yeah, <there is. laughs> but it's a damn cool car on the front. It is. <laughs> yes, it is. So. and you saw you saw the the lyrics insert. Is that old? Uh, the old owner, owner's manual that's yeah, in the glove yeah, box. Exactly. So uh, very, very cool pickup. And then this is um, from a past record store day. Yeah, baby. Uh, I, I I had the CD of the first Austin Powers soundtrack. Love the music on the Austin Powers soundtrack. Swing in London. Yeah. Uh, so when Jim said, hey, I can get that because I, I, I guess you had had this come through once before and I tried to get it. Someone bought it already. Yep. It was it was odd because it came in as a used uh, on a trade, and I, I had seen it was a record store day. Put it out in our drop video. You sent me a note. I had two other people ask about it as well after the person had picked it up earlier in the or in the day after the drop. I'm like, well, that could be something. And then it just happened to see it in one of our distributors, but it was on a back order. So I thought, well, what the heck? I'll put in for it. And lo and behold, the next week they found three of them for me. So I'm like, okay, it's a it's an old RSD, and they still had them. I wonder if it was an exclusive. It's still showing yes. up. <laughs> I don't know, but they're they're gone now. How's that? And okay. the, the stock we had in the store are gone also. At least for the time being. Well, that's also nice when you can bring in something like that and you know it's going to go out. You oh, know? Yeah, heck yeah. 
Yeah. Love yeah. when that happens. So that, that that's all I'll show. I, I okay. Do. What do you got? My week, my week was uh, it was it was a fun one. I kind of kept it in temper, and you know, there's a lot going on here as I'm I'm going through, trying to make some room because the record store day orders did go in last week, so mm -hmm. that's that's there. And so now I've got the realization that I've got to clear out some space in our back room for that stock when it comes in. So I'm kind of scrambling to get things around. This is after the 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 uh, the the um, storage unit clean out. <laughs> I'm still yeah. dealing with that. But I did find a couple of extra things, uh, two new ones and one used one that I'd kind of been uh, it been sitting in one of my back sock and I pulled it out and I thought, oh, cool. And I was surprised because I've got a, I've got a fairly decent uh, collection of ZZ Top albums. I like their older stuff. Yeah. But as I got through, it's like, well, I did not have a copy of Rio Grande Mud from 1972. And this has got some great stuff on there. Francine. Uh, mm -hmm. Just Got Paid is on there and uh, Barbecue. So some great uh, ZZ Top blues. I love that older sound, uh, sound of the blues stuff. And their earlier stuff especially, I really get into. And again, I was really surprised I didn't have this. This one I, I have noted before. Uh, it's it's tough to find in real good condition because the cover's a little... It's, it's more of that paper than it is a, a laminate of sorts. Sure. And so it really collects the dirt. It, uh, this, there was a sticker on this one. The uh, the spine is a little bit frayed, but still the vinyl's in great shape, so I'm happy to have that one in. Good. One. I picked up a here's the surprise. I, I had a bootleg uh, shipment come in. Okay. <laughs> so I picked up another Rush bootleg that I probably didn't need to pick up, uh, but it's from a concert. Uh, this is it's it's called Roll of the Dice, which is a take on their Roll the Bones album. The uh, the uh, European bootleggers don't have a whole lot of uh, imagination, I think, when it comes. Sometimes they do, but the, the more current ones, they don't. Uh, this is, yeah, Roll of the Dice, and it's got a take of some of their album covers on the front. And this is uh, theoretically a live uh, FM radio broadcast that was on WMMS in Dane County, or Madison, Wisconsin, rather. Uh, this is a performance from the Dane County Coliseum in April of 1994. So... I don't believe I've got any rush of that era and the unofficial side, so I picked this up. And it's kind of cool. It's on yellow vinyl. Again, nothing. The packaging isn't very cool, but the, the uh -huh. vinyl is nice. And what I found odd about this is the fact that uh, it is a live show with several tracks, um, I mean, from that 90s, late 80s era, going all the way back. They've got some older stuff. Um, but it fades out in between each uh, track. So instead wow. of one live continuous uh, continuous live track, it'll fade out, come back up, and fade out and come back up. So you know, Jim, when I, when I was at the record show, there's one vendor. You talk about these bootlegs; it, they had cramps, and I mean, there's a couple a dozen of cramp bootlegs. I mean, it's like holy moly, you know. <laughs> uh, Steve, little secret: I see those in my distributor list and on my uh, bootleg list every week. And I, I said, no, Steve does not need these. I won't even tell you about them. So. <laughs> If you ever decide you need one, let me know. Okay. <laughs> and then finally, this was just kind of an impulse. Uh, an impulse. I needed a, a couple of other things on my uh, order list. And I got uh, something from these guys we talked about a few weeks back. And the only other one I could find, Shadowy Men on a Shadowy Planet. And this is their album. I have to get the album title right because it's kind of a cool one. Sport Fishing, The Lure of the Bait, The Luck of the Hook. So... <laughs> um, we talked about these guys a, a little while back and uh, Shadowy Men on a Shadowy Planet, of course, they got their start or they're more well known, if you will, as the uh, the band that uh, did the theme song for the kids in the hall and uh, all their stuff and all their bumper music. And this is it's a very cool album. Uh, I'm looking at my track list here. There are much like the first. Let's see. There are 24 tracks on this. The majority of them. I see a four minute one this time around, but the majority of them shortest being about 11 seconds, uh, maybe 27 seconds, but usually in the two minute, uh, the two minute mark and discogs again, they'll call this alternative rock garage rock surf. But, uh, one of their songs on here, uh, side B, we're not an effing surf band. <laughs> uh, this is, it's just fun. It's mostly instrumental. There's some other vocals that are, kind of vocals in there but i'm really digging this stuff um and when when you're an instrumental primarily band you can get away with song titles 
uh that's one like fortune telling chicken uh -huh. <laughs> plastics for 500 bob uh that was ear me calling a horse the singing cowboy farb spy school graduation theme cheese in the fridge hair gel when you're surf instrumental band you can name them whatever you want because yeah. it has nothing to do with the lyrics exactly well, fun stuff on that uh, shadowy men from a shadowy planet um I, I may look they've got a couple of other releases but after the two that i picked up i'm gonna have to go digging elsewhere i.e discogs to look for that stuff go from exactly. there so as always uh, we will put together a spotify playlist so you can listen to sound samples of the stuff we've talked about i think we should be okay finding most of this I don't think I'm going to find that specific live rush on Spotify, but you never yeah. know. We'll see what we can dig. But that'll be in the description in uh, the episode below. And we also put up the playlist link on our Facebook page, Two Guys Talking About Records. So check that out when you get a chance, please. Okay. Steve, I got a, I got a couple of news stories I need to gripe about. Is that okay before we dive into the uh, the gateways? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's just do that. Now, we, we don't like to be negative on the show, but just sometimes... We don't. This one, I'm not going to be negative because I actually personally view this as kind of a positive in a way. So here I am, you know, mon last Monday, I'm trying to think what we did. We we submitted our orders for Record Store Day, Black Friday. The requests came in for the folks' wish list. Again, you can't pre-order, so we just find out what folks want to order them. Feeling good about myself. I got the orders in. I thought, well, it's not too bad. We, we got a lot of stuff. It's going to be a good Record Store Day, Black Friday. And then Kim goes, oh, my. And I said, what? She found a new story that says this. <laughs> Taylor Swift announces two Taylor Swift Black Friday exclusives yeah. dropping on Black Friday. And I thought, oh, come on. Seriously. My first thought was like, oh, crap. And then further on into it. It uh, turns out that these are Target exclusives only. One is a book for her uh, Tortured Poets, the Eras Tour book. And the second is a uh, Tortured Poets Department, the Anthology, an album that's coming on both vinyl and CD. This has extra tracks exclusive to the retailer, yada, 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 yada. So, you know, this is the second time that uh, Taylor Swift again, this is not me griping, mind you, because a couple of years ago, she did that Record Store Day. It was a seven inch and it was well received. Then that album on Record Store Day uh, came out uh, uh, Black Friday, I believe it was. And we had a, a huge line and everybody in the industry is like, oh, Taylor Swift cares so much about indie record stores. Oh, she's helping out with Record Store Day. It's such a great thing that she's doing. And then in April on Record Store Day, she surprised announced a release the day before that yeah. Friday release. And I, and I was scrambling and it was a big pain in the backside. And uh, yeah, we had, we did it. We, we moved a lot of her records that day because they were indie store exclusives, but still it was like, here's record store day coming. And then all of a sudden, ta-da, I'm Taylor Swift. And I'm going to jump up in front of the record store day with my stuff and announce this. And so I was actually, and I don't mean to be, I don't mean to besmirch the Taylor Swift fans because we've got a few Taylor Swift fans that are loyal customers of the store and that's great, but um, I'm happy that this is a Target exclusive. There, I said it. <laughs> Let them deal with it. Now, no, go ahead. does that mean, I, I, I don't know. There very well could still be a surprise announcement. I don't know. And at this point, I don't really care if we get it, we get it. If we don't. I am not going to. Uh, I'm not going to freak out about it this year. Yeah, you know, I. It would just be how many millions and millions did Target pay to have that just yeah. for them? Because I, yeah. I just know when I worked in you know mass retail, you had to pay. You want something exclusive, and now it's gotten even bigger than what it was. You know when you think yeah. back in the '80s and '90s, I that has to be millions. Yeah, and, and Taylor has partnered with Target for years on stuff. Yeah, and, and think of the line now for, I mean, Black Friday lines suck anyway. It's not as bad as it used to be because of online. It'll be interesting to see if this will be online also or if you have to go to the store. I think we dug up a, a Reddit thread on this that was talking about it being an in-store. And okay. then that begs the question, yeah. Target's, some of them will open at midnight, but... 
They're saying, mm-hmm. okay, well, this is not going to be available till six or eight in the morning or something. I'm like, yep, they're going to wait. I'm sure they will. Most yep. of the stores. And if they have um, it over, then it will go online. Oh yeah. You bet. You bet. But uh, I think the main purpose is they're trying to drive some um, traffic. I mean, this story is from a, a website called retail wire. So mm-hmm. they're all about, uh, they're all about driving that traffic in. And yep. again, she's done wonders for independent record stores, but in April with that surprise announcement a couple of weeks before. And then now with this one, I feel it really undercuts record store day. But again, the Taylor Swift fan, generally, generally speaking, we do have a few, as I mentioned, cool ones that come into the store here. Generally speaking, uh, when there's a big Taylor Swift indie store thing, we'll see 90% of those customers one time and one time only to get that. And then they won't come back. Yeah. Yeah. Target. Good luck to you. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, amazing. I, I, I got a hand to them for being able to keep her corralled because you know Walmart has to be looking at you. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, um, I'll deal with that. Now the other story, let's dive into very quickly. I don't want to take up too much time in this. I know a lot of folks have been talking about this. Yeah. Uh, report popped up last week. Well, the twentieth. Uh, oh, updated on the twentieth. But let me go to this first. It was last week, and I sent this to you. A report popped up saying, uh, let's see here, vinyl sales plummet by 33% in 2024 after a decade of rapid growth. And I was like, well, okay, how how about that? And uh, then almost immediately, I mean, almost immediately after that, the company that does the tracking, this was based on a billboard, uh, by the way, this was based on a billboard going through a company called Luminate, which uh, tracks online or tracks sales. And later the day, this story pops up, they clarify that vinyl sales have not dropped in 2024. (laughs) They just changed the way that they count stuff. And that was misinterpreted in the original story saying that there was a drop in vinyl sales. So, you know, I think I'm going to chalk this up to... uh, you know, what I just kind of tend to believe, if if I see this in any kind of news, mainstream-ish thing, don't believe anything you read right now. Russia, because, damn yeah, Russian bot. Yeah. Because quite, and I, this this is coming from the old radio and television side of me, uh, when we used to have to deal with the Nielsen or Arbitron books, the ratings. Uh, you, can, you can glean anything out of data and make it say whatever you want it to say with enough imagination. So yeah. if it was misinterpreted, then it was just read incorrectly by the the folks that were reporting on the data that Luminate had come out and said, okay, there's a, a sale or the, a drop in sales. You know, when, when I oh. saw that, Jim, I, I, I panicked. It was like the Great Depression was happening. I immediately went and pulled 400 <laughs> record albums and sold them right away. It didn't matter what the price was. I just wanted to get what I could before before the whole vinyl dropped out. And then they come with a retraction. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say, no, psych, just kidding. Now, there, the, one of the other things that really, really bugged me about this story, Steve, yeah. is that this this is from Head head to phonesty i guess is the the website on that and again they did issue a retraction they did put an update on this of their story as well but the speed to which this and a couple of other articles i read jumped on the fact that vinyl sales are plummeting it was it was almost like a see we told you it wouldn't last uh it was too good to be true we didn't really believe that it was going to go anyway so there you go and the story was almost like uh like reading a eulogy, if you will, <laughs> talking about, well, the industry did this to themselves between pricing and oversaturation. But yeah. you and I agree that those are all problems. Mm-hmm. It's just that the, these authors of these articles seem to jump on that a little too gleefully and a little too quickly yeah. and then had to go, oops, sorry. Exactly. Maybe now, not. You know, this, this, there's a lot of channels that jumped on this and our friend Chance on his, um, on on concert buddy he has his um podcast surface noise i believe it's on thursday yep. they, they really went into this and one interesting thing that they brought up was the fact that even when they look at this data on a uh, record sales it doesn't take in band camp because band yep. camp is done so differently and, and you think of the thousands of artists that are on band camp i mean i buy you know just you know today i was on band camp again probably should not have been uh but i did it without <laughs> drinking so um but there's you know it just 
they, they sell so many albums that aren't even ac accounted for with all yep. of this. There's a flaw in the system, obviously, and stuff, as I mentioned, can be interpreted or reinterpreted however it suits those who want to look at the data. Yeah. Now, anecdotally speaking, I can tell you from the record store owner side of it that things had slowed down. I don't think that they're declining so much as they are just kind of slowing. I don't know as if we've gotten to the peak, but definitely uh, July, August, and September were a little slower than the year previous. So. Yeah. And again, much like the articles that that kind of gleefully pointed out, you and I have talked that there's overpricing going on. There's oversaturation. There's stuff being pressed that probably shouldn't be pressed. It's like, why are you repressing, you know, these some of these albums that sit and sit and sit in dollar bins or, you know, bargain bins around? Here? Yeah, I know. It just blows my mind. <laughs> now, and the, the thing is, though, is I do believe, I mean, I truly believe that some of the biggies in the industry, the record companies, are recognizing that. That's why we're seeing these Rhino, the Rocktober releases, for the most part, the single LPs came out at $25 a piece, which shows that they're, I think, at least aware of the fact that they may have been overpricing some of these things. But then you turn around and I said that, you know, we, we griped about the Billy Springs here, the strings here at the store being a $50 album, but it's a really good album. So, yeah. <laughs> but it's still 50 bucks for a double LP. Mm -hmm. So we're, I, I think we're seeing right now, we're seeing two extremes. I don't think that there's any really moderation in there anymore, but they've brought that down to at least some of these releases to that $25 level. And granted three, four years ago, those were all $20. So that still shows an increase in it. But I think what we're getting is now the low end is going to be $25. The high end is going to be 50 plus for double LPs or box sets or whatever you will. So there, I don't see a heck of a lot in between. Uh, Jim, I, I personally blame the um, your your slow sales. I call it the Steve effect. And I'm not there every Sunday saying, what's this sound like putting it on and go, oh, maybe I'll just buy that. I have to go back and look, but that may coincide with your moving to uh, Colorado. I should look at our sales. For, for those that don't know, you know, every Sunday I would always visit Jim from 12 to 1, and I would be looking at albums and bands. What's this sound like? And we'd be putting them on and playing there. I go, well, I'll buy that. I'll buy that. And, you know, and just, yeah, I don't uh, think it's costly. To Steve's credit, I still do. And I sent out a package to you yesterday. Yeah, so you exactly. got some stuff coming your way. Yeah. Jim, Jim is still my number one record store. There we go. And I much appreciate that. Okay. Well, thank you for indulging me on that, Steve, uh, to talk a little bit about some news stories. And at the, again, I'm not griping, but you know, I'm just, I'm a simple man. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> trying to pair my wares here at the record store and yep. make my way. And again, I'm not, I'm not pleased any Swifties listening. I am not predicting that there's going to be an indie store tag on to this prior to Black Friday. I'm just saying I wouldn't be surprised if there was one from Taylor Swift. Just saying, I would like to be proven wrong because if there is, I'm going to have to have my arm twisted to take part in it. And I'm just being honest there. So. My, my advice is get in line now. So you'll be the first there. You know, I mean, people can bring you food. You, you can do your school through and you know, the internet now. Yeah. Be the record store day, black Friday is a tough one because this is Michigan and it's the end of November and it could be anywhere from 60 degrees to minus 20. So we, we'll talk about that and we'll let you know as we get closer in the next month. So this week on the podcast, two guys talking about records. Uh, Steve says, you know what? I had a little epiphany and backed up traffic is what you said when you thought of this. Yeah, I did. Got honked at. <laughs> it's like, oh, this would be a great idea. Oh, wait, maybe I'll go home and then I'll tell Jim about it later. But uh, gateway albums. You know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, what is your first experience into music? We've talked about that on the podcast. My first albums were this. But what we don't really delve into is that for those of us who collect multiple genres, things that maybe we had, you know, I, I grew up as a kid, like young kid growing up on a farm, it was country music. And I developed kind of a distaste for country music for whatever reason in there. Wow. So as a late middle schooler and getting into high school, then I discovered rock and roll through Rush and some friends. And I became, uh, you know, I, like ACDC and Def Leppard, and Judas Priest in that early 80s, uh, early 80s hard rock. Those were the gateway for me into there. 
But as I began collecting and more in earnest into the 90s, collecting seriously, uh, vinyl specifically, I'm thinking, okay, I'm collecting this, this, and this, and the things that I enjoy. But then once in a while, something sneaks in. And that's what we would call a gateway album. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, Columbia Record Club did a lot of that for me because I didn't send in my card ever. So I'd get that and go, well, what is that? And it would take me on a different journey. But I, I have found through my years that oftentimes my journey begins in a record store. And as I go into something new, uh, now it's a little different with the internet and everything, but otherwise the record store was just a phenomenal place where I started a new journey. You know, it actually had a customer come in. It was a family. Um, it was an, an older adult child with, was his, his father. And they came in and he didn't want to pick up anything that day. He goes, Oh, I'm just here for the vibe. It's like, all right, yeah. man, I get it. I should put vibe on our, uh, yeah. <laughs> our selling vibe. We can in there. But yeah, I know I agree with you. And that's really the way in. But a lot of times these, these experiences may be on a genre or a subgenre that we're not familiar with. And I've openly said, okay, there's some that, that I just don't get. Uh, you know, we talked about Prague, and I think both of us are bigger Prague fans than we realized, according to the comments. <laughs> Um, I have spoken before about uh, my newer affinity for bluegrass. And I thought, okay, what is the album that made me start thinking in terms of maybe I can open my, uh, my, my, my brain up a little bit to collecting some bluegrass albums, not yeah. specifically country, but bluegrass. So when Steve suggested this, I went through and I said, okay, so what are some genres outside of the biggies? Of course, you know, we could say rock. And if I'm going to say rock, that's kind of a gimme. I'm going to say Rush and, uh, you know, Pink Floyd, even though that's more on the uh, prog side. Black Sabbath, uh, Volume 4 for hard rock. But I, I found five genres that over the course of my life, and this is going back to the early college years through fairly recently, that I feel has been opened up by a specific album. And the genres I'm going to look at on my side, Steve, include blues, psychedelic rock. I'm going to call it college radio music. We can discuss yeah. Jangle punk rock and i'll quotation the punk rock in there and bluegrass so those are the five and i'm gonna i've got five albums that i'll pull through on there what what are your genres that that you're uh you're you're being led into through this yep. gate mine 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 will be new wave uh it will be the blues it will be psychedelic post uh, kind of before punk i don't even know what the hell jazz okay. and zamrock Zamrock being, oh, yep. <clears throat> the S, you are, well, again, the, the king of Zamrock. Yeah. Well, I, you know what? There's one that we have in common, and that is the blues. So what uh, what album kind of opened the door for you blues-wise? Yeah. And I'll show you mine, and we'll see where that takes us. So this is uh, this is a reissue from Record Store Day, but um, Chicago, the blues today. And I, I began listening to this in when I was living in the uh, Chicago suburbs, Fox Lake, Palatine. I, I would always, you know, in the 80s, you know, I did, you know, I was working, but there wasn't a ton of money. So I would go to the library and I would just check out record albums and I would bring them home and I would take them. I know I was pirating before even they were talking about pirating, but I, I would bring them home. And I remember seeing a blues album and I didn't, only thing I knew about the blues was the blues brothers. That was it. And, uh, but I never experienced it. And so they had volume one and I checked that out and I was blown away. They had junior Welsh, Chicago blues band, Otis Rush was on here. Johnny shines. It, it was it was the most amazing thing, and I went back. They had Volume Two uh, at the library, and J. B. Hutto, Jimmy Cotton, um, Johnny's Young Southside Blues Band. They did not have Volume Three, uh, but I, I'm just it was the most amazing stuff. And and this album, you know, even after the flood, I needed to get these back in, and I'd found a couple of them already. But then this came out for a record store day. But um, yeah, I I went heavy into the blues and i had a very large blues cd collection it was you know three four hundred blues cd wow. um you know that now my blues collection is not that big but i keep trying to find new stuff and bring it on but yeah big time 
How I about find that interesting too that that was a various artist sampler, and mine is going to be similar to that. Yeah, uh, that leads you into the the bigger thing. Now, the blues is tricky because you can say, okay, well, as a rock, as somebody who listened to a lot of rock, I'm listening to Zeppelin. Okay, well, that's blues, or you can get the bluesier side of this or that. Okay, I get it, but straight up blues was something that didn't come to me straight away. Yeah, and. and this is don't don't laugh. You mentioned it, but don't laugh. This is probably my foray, the gateway. And I know that there's going to be some purists who say, well, the Blues Brothers really wasn't blues, so to speak. It's like I get it. Yes. And I agree with you to some respect. But the fact that, uh, you know, the movie came out in what, 1980. So I would have been 15 at the time. So I didn't see the movie right away because it was rated R, of course. So I had to wait a little while, probably till it was on VHS. But even if it wasn't more traditional blues, it talked about traditional blues. It, it, in, you know, it, it uh, envisioned some traditional blues with John Lee Hooker playing in the street mm -hmm. and the like, um, and uh, you know, Cab Calloway coming in. But that's going to be more big bandish uh, stuff in there. But this, I, I, I saw the movie and I got the album afterwards. I thought, okay, this is a good way to start getting into it. And if that's the case, and if it's not real blues. Now I've got Muddy Waters. I've got John Lee Hooker. I've got some good John, you know, the British blues, which is a whole another story. Yeah. But this was kind of the gateway that led me into saying, I think I could explore some of this a little bit further. Mm -hmm. And like you, I don't have an extensive blues collection, but I do have some, I think some, some really good ones in there. So, yeah. Yeah, it's um, it, it's 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 a wonderful genre that goes in all like oh, yeah, like yeah. any musical genre. It goes all over the place. Yep, it does. And I I do have the copy of that Third Man. I know you had the big one pre flood, but the uh, the Third Man Ann Arbor Blues Fest, uh, the uh -huh. double LP version of that. I still have that. That's a rough recording to listen to because the audio quality is so poor. But historically speaking, that is just a tremendous piece of work. Yeah, yeah. I I did bring that back in my collection. The the bigger the bigger one. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Good. Well, what do you have next? Uh, what genre uh, are you touching so, on? Another gateway that was not yeah. technically your first, but I'm I'm open to exploring this further. You bet. Uh, yeah, it'd be talking heads not making sense. You know, this came out, was it 77, 78? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was just buying basically AM. There's some classic rock now, you know, Pink Floyd. I knew them, stuff like that. But I was sitting in the dorm down in Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, they, on, on uh, Saturday Night Live, Talking Heads came out, and they did For Artists oh, Only nice. and Take Me to the River. And it was just like this life-changing event. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and like, I... I, my 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 whole my whole world of music came crumbling down on what I knew, and suddenly it's like, wow! Listen to that, and it was just this new style, new way. I didn't know about punk even because it, you know, you know in Nebraska, we we heard about punk in 1991 or something like that. Uh, yeah, it, we were always a little bit late. Disco came about 1982, uh, so you know Nebraska's behind the curve on some of this, but. This, this is, so, I mean, I, I went immediately the next day, Sunday, to Pickles Record Store. I, there's my original I had, and picked this up. I had to have it, and I played it so much. I, it was just incredible. I, I could never get enough of it. It's still one of my all-time favorite albums because of the impact. And, and that's exciting when you have that album that makes that huge impact upon you. And when I think of all genres, this thing was gigantic and it totally shifted where I began looking for in music. And it wasn't about necessarily what's on this radio, but other things that were happening. And you would consider that, uh, would you consider that new wave? Would you consider that alternative or what umbrella? I, new, new wave is what they were called. You know, some would call them art punk. Uh, you know, as, but I, I think it really, it opened up to me the new wave genre, not the synth heavy stuff, but the B-52s, yeah. uh, the, you know, REMs and all that. We began shifting. My story is tremendously similar to that uh, because it took me, you know, I graduated from high school in 1983. And as I mentioned, I'm into that harder rock and I'd seen, been to concerts, ACDC and Judas Priest and uh, Def Leppard saw those, saw Rush all the time too. 
So I went to college at Northern Michigan University in 85, a couple of years after. So I waited a little after high school. And by the time I ended up over at the college radio station, I was like, you know, ACDC, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then I started, uh, I had to stop and think what got me into college radio music, so to speak. You know, it could be jangle pop. It could be new wave, whatever you wanted to call it. And I'm going to point down to one album and that this is the uh, call. Uh, and their modern Romans album. And this is not a tremendous go-to for me, but the song The Walls Came Down is one of my all-time favorite pieces of music everywhere. And having started listening to that at the station and playing this on the air from time to time, it sat me thinking that this is not heavy-duty rock and roll. This is not Ozzy. This is not, you know, it is not to ACDC, but this is something a little different. It's not quite jangle pop either, but... Like you, this album helped opened up that gate for me. And then all of a sudden I thought, well, let me listen to R.E.M. Let me listen to Guadalcanal Diary. Let me listen to the Talking Heads because these are all somewhat related in that college radio format. And then that led to They Might Be Giants and all these other things. And I can point to uh, Modern Romans as one of the, the catalysts for this because this is one of my earlier experiences. Uh, this sucker came out in 1983. So by the time I got to college... It had already been a couple of years old and faded off the charts by then, the college radio charts, but still had enough of an impact on me to uh, to to say this is a, a genre that I think I could really get into. And I, I did get into college radio music, if you will, for, and it's still to this day, I'm, I'm, I'm geared toward that. You know, you look at something like Wet Leg, and I would equate them more with that type of sound yeah. than I would with, with really anything else. They're more pop, but... I still think they've got a lot more in common with the college radio music of the eighties. I, 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 I totally agree with that because it's not straightforward. Yeah. No, it, it's a little unclassifiable. Uh -huh. Well, which one, which one next? Where did your, uh, where did your gate leaving openness take you? <laughs> okay. So we, we were in Lincoln. We we're in, we we're in Nebraska. Let's see. We were in uh, Illinois. This one comes courtesy of when I was living in Iowa and, okay. uh, in Waterloo, Iowa, I was there for a few years. Uh, you know, again, my my job moved me around, and uh, there there was in Cedar Falls. There was a college, um, a North Northern Iowa, and there was a little record store, and I got to know them. And you know, it, you know, I would go in there when I'd get my paycheck, and I would start buying albums. Well, the guy in there introduced me. He goes, "You need to listen to this." It was the Velvet Underground. He goes, this, this is important. I have zero idea who the Velvet Underground was, never heard of them or whatever. But, you know, these new represses came out in the 80s. And the one he introduced me to was their self-titled The Velvet Underground. Why? Because this is very accessible. And so it was an easy way to go in. So this record store, you know, and this was at the, the employee, though the manager also, you know, um, she, she also said, yeah, you got to have this. So Oh, well, okay. If I got to have it, I'll buy that. You know, um, Jim plays that on me all the time. Uh, so, uh, so I bought it and I went back and I bought every one of their albums. I, I, I it was just the most amazing music that I'd never heard of. And it, it just, it kind of psychedelic, but not, it, you know, it's, it's not really punk, but yet it's important to punk, uh, you know, post-punk droning shoegaze, you know, they take aspects. I you just think of how this band is fit into so many genres. And, but it was because in those Cedar Falls, Iowa, some record store uh, person I got to know in there, you know, said, I think you would like this because I was buying a lot of college, you know, radio stuff, Jim, you know, yeah. like we were talking about, that's what I was looking for. And he goes, you need to try this. And uh, yeah, I was like one of my all time favorite bands, uh, but if, I would not have known about it if it hadn't been for that store employee. Hmm. Again, kind of a similar trip for me um, after college. And by after college, I mean, I, I finished up at Northern in 1990. And prior to that, we've got the hard rock. And then all of a sudden, my eyes were open to the, the, the new wave, the alternative college radio music, a little punk. Then I begin to work, work backwards. I met uh, through a place I was working. I met a guy who was a record collector named Michael Klassen a friend of mine from way back then. And I would go over to his place and he had this massive collection and I was still kind of starting off. 
And he says, well, what else do you like? I said, well, you know, I, I always had some Floyd. It's, it's rock. It's uh, prog, whatever. He goes, well, what about psych rock? And said, okay, well, and this is, this is the <laughs> only Starship album I own. But it's not technically even a Starship mm -hmm. album. This is uh, Paul Kantner. Uh, right, I had to do some reading to remember this, but uh, after the demise and breakup of Jefferson Airplane, Paul Kantner had been working on this stuff, uh, and this is technically called Paul Kantner Jefferson Starship. So this was technically speaking the first Star Jefferson Starship album, not Starship. Sorry. Uh, but this is a 19, and I, again, I had to go backwards for this psychedelic rock. Um, let me find this one here, 1970. And this is almost a concept album, and it's very trippy. It's folk rock, acid rock, psych rock, according to uh, according to Discogs. But uh, you know, my friend said, "Check this out. You got to start listening to some of this stuff." And I did, and it really was. It reminded me a little bit of Floyd, but it wasn't Floyd, and uh, it kind of took things in a different direction on the psychedelic. I'm not still the biggest, uh, not the biggest psychedelic rock fan, but this one was just a fun one to listen to, and the. You know, the I think at the time this would have been 1991 ish. Uh, they talked about 1989 and 1990 as this they were going to hijack a giant starship and escape Earth. Yeah, that was kind of the theme going through this. And even though that this says Jefferson Starship, you've got uh, the likes of Paul Kantner and he brought along uh, Grace Slick, uh, Mickey Hart here as well, but also brought in the likes of Graham Nash, David Crosby. And Jerry Garcia, they're all part of this Starship crew mm -hmm. that are going to be taking off with Paul Kantner. So that was really the first foray into psychedelic rock, so to speak. And I do have some psych rock. And, you know, with that collection we brought in a few years ago, I've been, you know, leaning into that a little bit more here and there. It's a slower go. But when I find one I like, I think they're pretty cool. And it's it still boggles my mind that uh, the Starship built this city came from something like this so yeah yeah that's their own. that's 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 an interesting the lyrics is like wow <laughs> concept album is that Prague? hmm <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but it's got jerry garcia and crosby stills and nash so no maybe uh, not yeah who knows? No. okay my next one uh jazz now in all honesty kind of blue was the 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 moment of, where my life changed but this was also important. This is Cannonball Adderley's Quintet's Mercy, 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 live at the club. And look, they got all that nice glare. Well, it's, it's still in the shrink on here. This was one of the first jazz albums I went out and bought, and I found it in a bin because I suddenly was interested in jazz. This was just the coolest, most accessible but just finger snapping stuff. This wasn't slow jazz or anything. It, it had soul, which Cannonball Adderley, he played with soul. And it, 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 it got me really much more excited with jazz, trying to find similar type music to what he was doing. Uh, more of the soul jazz. You know, it wasn't organ dominated or anything. It's just the way it was. And, you know, the song Mercy, Mercy, Mercy just blew me away. And, and so, you know, I got into jazz when I was living in Minnesota because that's where my neighbor introduced me to jazz, two kind of blues, two bitches brew. But then he began giving me other CDs of things too because he already knew that, hey, he created an addict. So let's bring him some more CDs. <laughs> so I in, so I injected those CDs into my system, into my brain, and um, yeah, went after jazz, but you know, not all of jazz. I can't get into every genre, but this one was wonderful, and it's it's still to me one of the, my all-time favorite jazz albums. Uh, just blew me away. I'm backtracking a little bit because I'm going to go back to college radio. And even though I said college radio music, I'm going to branch off of that and talk about punk rock. And again, yeah, the dead milkmen are punk, but are they punk punk like we would talk? I still think we owe a full episode to dissect what is punk rock at some point. But yeah. the dead milkmen and big lizard in my backyard and especially the song bitch and Camaro mm -hmm. in my college radio days helped me think a little bit more about punk rock. And that yeah. led me to having an extensive Dead Milkman collection. Not quite a completist. Yeah, there's some CDs that I don't have, but if they press them on vinyl, maybe. But 
such a fun record, uh, such an irreverent record, yep. uh, politically incorrect record yeah. <laughs> so at the time. Tons of fun, but Big Lizard and uh, Bitch and Camaro especially were just fun ones off of uh, Big Lizard in my backyard. And that was my foray into punk rock. Yeah, I remember grabbing that when it came out too because oh, of yeah. Bitch and Camaro. <laughs> yeah, I ran over my neighbors. I'm drunk on unleaded. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, my final one, uh, when I was living in Michigan, I traveled around and yeah. I bought this in Cincinnati. Now, this is an original. I bought a repress that I no longer have, but it was the Ngozi family. I was at a record store there, Shake It Records in Cincinnati, wonderful record store. And I'm downstairs and I'm browsing through the African music. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I was aware of Fela Kuti at the time, looking for some of that or something different. And I asked the, a guy working down there, I says, so what, what's, what would be really cool? And he goes to the wall and says, we, we have these here. They're hard to find. It was a two album set of the Ngozi family. And, and, you know, it had day of judgment, which was like, I believe their first album. It goes, this is incredible. This is hard to find. Give this a shot. And so, you know, I finally got back home. I, I put that on and it was just this hard rocking, but yet there's this kind of African beat going on, but it was just amazing how they tore up the music. Yeah, it's a little bit, I uh, you know, it's not polished, but you don't want it polished. You want, you know, this is like, like raw rock coming out of Africa. And um, that introduced me to the Zamrock. Uh, and, uh, and, and I just, you know, Zamrock lasted only a couple years. Someday I need to do an episode just on Zamrock. But uh, this was very good. And right, this is, now this, this is an original press and these go for, yeah, stupid amounts of money. Uh, but it's just phenomenal. And so Ngozi family was my entryway in a day of judgment. You can buy that on repress now. You know, it's been nice. They've repressed a lot of the major Zamrock albums through a lot. They haven't, but the big stuff they have. So, uh, yeah, a record store again down there in Cincinnati, a record employee got me going into this. Otherwise, I never would have. I mean, I would not have thought about picking it up. So great stuff. And that is, I think, one of the instances, too, where we talk about a gateway album. That gate for you with Zamrock was left wide open. <laughs> Absolutely, man. I began, But it was so hard to find at the start, you know. I mean, you really had to search and search. And then, of course, Discogs helped. But, you know, I began finding it. And, uh, yeah, it's 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 been wonderful. Well, my final genre is a fairly recent one. You know that we've been uh, talking and I've, I've been talking a lot about Billy Strings and how much I enjoy him, Sturgill Simpson and the like. Um, uh, we're talking about bluegrass at this point. So the more modern bluegrass and my lack of affinity for country music from my childhood probably held all, it kept me from yeah. enjoying stuff in the interim. But several years back, I had um, heard a couple of tunes from Bela Fleck and yeah. really enjoyed that. Um, and it's... Bela Fleck is interesting because it it's bluegrass and it's banjo, but it's not jazz. quite. Yeah, it's jazz in some cases. So I really wouldn't consider that too much into there where Billy Strings is bluegrass, but he's also a jam band. He's he's uh, got some, you know, some folk and uh, it's it's hard to com uh, complain in there, but or ex explain in there. But if I had to pick one album that really kind of opened things up, I'm going to go back to the movie well and my fan, my fandom mm -hmm. of movies and point to the O Brother Where Art Thou soundtrack yeah. as a straight up, and it's, I yes, it's bluegrass, but it's really just more traditional in a lot of cases, but they've made this more modern by putting it into a movie and having George uh, Clooney lip sync to that. Um, so double LP, I love the movie. You know, I, I love the Coen brothers and their stuff. This is one of my favorite movies. So naturally I wanted the soundtrack. And then as I begin getting into the soundtrack, saying, well, this... I really enjoy this music, especially in the context of the movie, but even on its own on a, on a, on an album, I can still enjoy this. So that got me thinking, well, this Bela Fleck stuff is not bad. Okay. The Sturgill Simpson bluegrass stuff. That's not bad either. Billy strings is blowing my mind currently. So this, I think another various artists soundtrack pointing the way for me to open up to a new genre and say, maybe I can. 
Yep, the man of constant sorrow. Yep. One of my all time. I, I I love that song, man. Oh you yeah, play that. Oh wow. Even uh, even the Rod Stewart version. No, I haven't heard that one, and I'm not going to. <laughs> it's not too bad. Yeah. So there's five genres from each of us uh, that uh, was opened up by a particular album. I, I we didn't talk about this, but I do have a couple of honorable mentions and. Jazz and classical for me were a little tougher because into my middle school and high school age time, I was in the concert band and I was in a jazz band playing mm -hmm. percussion. So I was exposed to a lot of that. So it's really kind of hard to point to say, well, maybe I'd like classical, but maybe this, but I really didn't consider that collecting because I'd already been immersed in some of that music through those. But if I, <laughs> if I had a classical album to say, okay, I would pick this one, uh, my collection. It's the Hampton String Quartet, and the album is called uh, What If Mozart Had Written Born to Be Wild. <laughs> these are Hampton String Quartet doing uh, White Rabbit, Stairway to Heaven, Honky Tonk Women, Light My Fire, Sunshine of Your Love, Born to Be Wild, and Good Vibrations. So there's a nice little bridge to the classical side of things from good old classic rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, mine was handles music for water so there we go <laughs> very 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 classical indeed well what about you folks is there an album specifically an album that opened the door for you to say i think i can dig this type of music i hadn't really thought about this before but i think maybe i might like it based on this album and sometimes it works i'm trying i'm hard pressed to think you know, maybe there's a couple of, um, you know, older school rap or hip hop. And I just, I've still not been able to get into that pop albums, the more current ones we talked about wet leg. Yeah, that's pop, but I don't think it's pop. And that's not going to lead me to go buy further stuff like a Billie Eilish or a, a Taylor Swift or something like that. It's not my bag. I'll listen to it, but I don't consider that to be a gateway into that uh, genre for me. Mm hmm. Totally, totally agree. Uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's, and, and you never know, Jim, maybe we will find that album that will say, gosh, I like pop music. If that's the case, then you folks will know it because Steve and I will talk about it. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. I'm probably not going to stand in line on Black Friday to pick up that Taylor Swift, though. I've got other things to do. Okay. <laughs> Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm probably going to miss that one, too. So. Okay. Well, you folks can uh, connect with us via the Two Guys Talking About Records Facebook page or in the comment sections on Spotify and on the YouTube episodes of these. And uh, we're doing a little bit better. I'm answering a few, and I see you you engaging, too, and I'm keeping up with that the best that I can on, uh, on the YouTube side of things. But it's always appreciated uh, when you folks chime in. And uh, I'm hearing from a lot of other folks, too, uh, emailing me, saying that they listen to the podcast or watch the podcast. And that's just, uh, it's, it's great to hear. And I'm glad that you're doing it because Steve and I do this because we just can't stop talking to each other once a yeah. week on Sundays. Exactly. <laughs> so. yeah, and, and, uh, I, I had a few new new subscribers come over to my channel because they started by watching the podcast and they came over to my channel. Very so cool. uh, that, was, that was very nice, yeah. Well, always appreciated. And uh, so we'll continue to talk about records each week that we can do so. That's right. Because that's all right. That's it, man. All right. Well, Steve, you have a great week. Enjoy the cooling down temperatures in Colorado. And we're going to do so here in Michigan. Yep. I will, Jim. You also have a great week. And thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye.